That's with me. Father, we're here this morning because we love you, we honor you, and we want to worship you in every single thing that we do. No matter our gift, whatever it is you've blessed us with, you deserve our very best. May you be honored by our gifts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're a guest with us today, in the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been doing a series called Carols. And uh, we talked about a way in a manger the first week. Last week, Courtney and I spoke together on O Holy Night. And this morning, we thought it would be fun to discover the drummer boy. This carol was originally written as Carol of the Drum, and it was written by an American classical music composer and teacher. Her name was Catherine Davis. It was written in 1941. It wasn't recorded until 1951 by the Trapp family. And this carol's a little different than what we normally sing in church because most of our carols are based on scripture. This one, however, is not. There is no drummer boy in the Bible. Um, in the lyrics, the singer relates to how, as a poor boy, he was summoned by the Magi to go and see Jesus. So the wise men encouraged him. And he said, I have no gift to bring to lay before a king. Without a gift for Jesus, this little drummer boy just said, all I can do is play my drum. That's all I have. I have nothing to offer except to play for him. He got the approval of Mary. And it says that he honored him with his playing. Why? Because he played his best for him. And it says that he smiled at me. And so the whole point of this is that the boy felt as though he had nothing to give. But because he gave his best, he honored Christ in that moment. And it was enough. And a lot of times when we speak to you as um, standing up here as a minister, wanting to encourage you with something today, something from God's word, I like to usually end the sermon on thinking about what God is saying to us. What's this sermon going to say to me? What's the call to action is sometimes the question we want to ask. But I want to ask you this at the very beginning, coming out of worship, knowing we're going to worship God again in just a moment, knowing that worship is more than just singing a few songs, that worship is giving in the offering. Worship is living out our lives every single day for Christ. Knowing all of that, my question to you today is what gift do you bring that is fit for your king? What gift do you bring that's fit for your king? We always picture this story of the wise men as they're the ones that kind of invited this little drummer boy along in the song, we, we picture the story of the wise men as the kind of the Christmas card. You see a big star, and then you see three men on a camel. On three camels, not one camel. <laughs> That'd be pretty impressive. Three men riding on camels, following this star. However, that is not biblical either. We only know that there were three gifts offered to Christ on that day. We don't know how many of them were magi or wise men. But we know it was more than just three people that went on this trip. And this story of the wise men traveling to meet Christ is an intriguing one because these men began this long trip to Israel simply because a particular star was in the sky. That in itself is pretty amazing. Think about it. And to just say, hey, there's a star, let's follow it. And let's take up months, let's travel miles upon miles to follow this star. There had to be a reason. And we're going to find what that reason was. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to see the reason why these men were willing to travel so far to see this baby. Matthew chapter 2. This story of the wise men is meant more than just to entertain us. It's meant to teach us something today about seeking Christ. You received a bulletin when you came in the door. On the back of that, you can follow along with me. 
I have a few points I want to point out today out of this story. Also, if you just like to carry your phone and you're the digital person, you like that whole thing, you can follow along from our website. We put the notes on there and you can follow along. There's a place to find that on our website. Wonder what would be different if the wise men had been wise women. You ever think about that? <laughs> Wonder what would be different. Here's a few things I think would be different. Um, they would have stopped and asked for directions rather than telling King Herod about it. They would have asked long before that and known exactly where to go. They would have arrived on time and helped deliver the baby rather than showing up late, right? Come on, man, we, we own that. They would have cleaned the stable and brought some more practical things for the family, like casserole, diapers, and wipes, right? <laughs> and finally, the women always like this, there would be peace on earth, right? <laughs> I want to look at four things we can learn from the story of the wise men today. And first, I want to read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It says, The Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Everybody say worship him. Worship. You know, there's lots of different perspective on worship. So lots of different ways you can worship. Everybody has their own idea of how they worship. What's good worship? What's bad worship? Some of us just think of music. If it's the song I like, I worship. If it's not, I stand there. If it's my style and it's got a guitar, then I'm worshiping. If it's, you know, the organ, I can't do it. It's not for me. Worship can mean so many different things to so many people. But I find this story interesting. They came looking for this king of the Jews. They even mentioned that in verse 2 here. They say, born king of the Jews. Why, seeing the star, would this draw them to this king of the Jews? Brings me to point number one. God makes every effort to reach us. He makes every effort. He used a star to reach these pagan magician astrologers in order to bring them to Christ. These men were likely Gentiles who had come seeking. That's why they said the king of the Jews. These Jews thought the promised Messiah was for them. Christ was coming to deliver them of their sins, to deliver them from their oppressors. Yet this signal to the wise men was that God was calling these Gentiles to Christ. Understand, their religion would not have even been the same as the Jews. Magi it's, was a combination of learned science and cultic astrology. So they were very knowledgeable in math, science, astronomy, history, agriculture, and even the occult. Which tells us that God never abandons us. We're never too far gone from God. He will always do whatever it takes to reach us. If he could reach these Gentile astrologers, he's still working on people that you and I think are too far gone. And I think this is a great encouragement to us today as we come into the Christmas season, as we think about the family that we get together with and open presents with and share meals with and the friends that we have Christmas parties with. I know for myself, I can think of family members who are far away from God, and maybe you can too. But can I tell you something? God hasn't given up on them, and neither should we. He spoke to these astrologers in a way that they could understand. He could have spoke with an angel like he did for the shepherds or Mary. But maybe that would have been misinterpreted. I don't know. God knew the best way to reach them. And I'm so glad that he comes to, ways, it comes to us in ways that we can understand. And this is why God came in the flesh. He sent Jesus to this earth so he could walk with us, so that he could talk our language, so he could experience our culture and tell us of our need for him. But Jesus is no longer here. And if you'll remember, when he was leaving this earth, as he began to speak to the disciples, he took his role and he turned it over to them. And as disciples of Christ today, as followers of Christ, it is now our role. Jesus is no longer on this earth in the form of a human, so it's up to us 
to be Jesus to those people that we know are far away from God. Church, don't give up on them. Whoever it is that you're thinking of right now, that family member or friend that is so far from God, you think they could never accept him. It could be your kind words. It could be your love or your actions that could plant the seed and bring them to Christ. <coughs> God goes to any length in ways that we understand. You don't have to compromise your integrity or violate his commandments, but it's up to, do, up to us to do whatever means we can to reach them. Which brings me to point number two. We should make every effort to seek him. As we enter into this season, the danger we fall into is thinking that knowing about Jesus is enough. And the truth is, we can have all the knowledge of the Bible, we can follow God's commands, and still miss what the Christian faith is all about. Think about these wise men. They would have had very limited information about Jesus, or excuse me, about the Jewish Messiah, about this baby. They set off on a journey to find him. And if that take three months, four months, even longer for them to get there, but they were willing to go the distance. Yet, in Jerusalem, sitting six miles away, are the religious community in Jerusalem, the people that had a firm grasp on the Bible, the people who lived out the letter of the law as it was written in Scripture, they did all the rituals, they followed all the commandments, they knew about God from Holy Scriptures, yet when the, or the wise men show up and talk about this Messiah, they're stunned, they're shocked to find out that he's come. They had no idea. In fact, it says they were disturbed and troubled upon hearing the news. No clue that the king had been born. It took Gentile astrologers traveling hundreds of miles to tell them that Jesus had been born. And imagine how that would go over. Us Bible-believing Christians following Christ, if a practitioner of witchcraft came in the door and said, you missed it, Jesus was here, and you're just, you totally just missed it. How many of us would go, well, you're crazy, get out. <laughs> Think about it. You're not going to want to listen to that. If Jesus is going to come, he's going to show up for me, not for that dude. So rather than being overjoyed about the news of the Messiah coming, they were worried, they were skeptical, and they did nothing about it. And here's the amazing thing. Matthew chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, tells us that Herod went to the religious leaders and said, where is this going to take place? And they quoted Micah chapter 5, verse 2, which was a prophecy about the Messiah who would come to Bethlehem and he would be a shepherd to Israel. And they literally quoted the scriptures. They knew where it was going to happen, yet they missed it. The religious leaders knew exactly where it was going to take place. Unlike the wise men who traveled these miles to worship Christ, they couldn't even travel six miles to seek him out. Once again, probably not even believing these wise men. They just say, why don't you go check it out? They just send them on their way. Why would God tell these wise men about Christ and not the religious authorities? It's hard to think of why that would take place. But maybe, just maybe they were more concerned about their laws and rituals than the relationship. It's very easy to play Christian. It's very easy to follow the rules, to do the right things, to say the right things. We can have all the knowledge of the Bible. We can even have religious convictions. We can even live out God's commands to the letter and still miss the very best part, and that's the relationship. Jeremiah 29, 13 promises this. Though. When you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all of your heart. Just like the little drummer boy. Showing up. I got nothing to give. All I can do is play this drum. But I'm going to play my best. I'm going to do everything I can to honor you with all my heart. Do you long for more of God? Do you just go, you know what? I'm saved. I'm good to go. I just get up and live life every day and that's enough for me. Or do you say to yourself, God, if there's more of it, I want it. I desire to know you more. 
I desire to enjoy the relationship that I can have with you on a daily basis, not on Sunday mornings, not for a five-minute devotional that I do every other day. All throughout my day, I want to know you. I want more of you. Hebrews 11, 6 <laughs> says this. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. But then there's the promise of this, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. When you seek God, you will be rewarded. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good to know that we can be rewarded just by saying, God, I just want to know you more. I want to seek you. He goes to any lengths to reach us. We should go to any length to reach him. And when we get there, number three, this is a very simple message for you today. Number three, bring your best. Bring your best because he deserves nothing less than our best. He deserves. Little drummer boy, I have no gift to bring that's fit to give the king. Shall I play for you on my drum? Mary nodded, gave him the approval. The ox and lamb kept time. That's a pretty impressive ox and lamb. Do you guys know any that can keep time? That's pretty awesome. Mary just said, go ahead. And so he played his drum. I played my best for him, me and my drum. Church, what is it for you? What's your drum? What's the thing that you can come to God and say, here it is. I give it all to you. I give you my best. That means holding nothing back. What do you have to bring that is fit for your king today? Worship is not an option with Christ. Once the wise men reached Jesus, it says the first thing they did was worship. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Can I just give you some little, little clarity on this Christmas story once again? We always picture the wise men coming, showing up to the manger, you know, just a little later, and they show up and offer their gifts. Notice it says not to the manger, it says they came to the house, and they saw the child with his mother. This was months later, when they came, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But before they ever offered the gifts, they took time to worship. Even from the beginning of the story, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. That was the goal of the Magi from the very beginning, was to worship him. To accomplish their goal, they traveled great distances, certainly with great difficulty, and it makes me ask the question, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I, as I was putting this together, I began to ask myself, what effort do I put forth to worship my king? On a daily basis, church, we're not talking about this morning with the little song on the guitar. We're talking every single day when I get up, what do I do? What effort do I put forth to worship my king? Do we have to learn the lesson from these Gentile astrologers. And the difference is, they didn't even know what they were going to see. Church, we know Jesus. We have a lot different perspective. We know why he came to this earth. We know what he did on this earth and why he did it. How many of you are glad that he came for you and me? Can you say amen to that? Amen. And if we know that, shouldn't he deserve our best? How much effort do I put forth? They sacrificed greatly. They overcame disappointment, endured hardship, and they were willing to put aside any of their own comforts, of home even, to jump in a caravan and travel together to get to the end of the star to see baby Jesus. Can I tell you, you will go deeper in your relationship with God if you will learn to express your gratitude towards him. It's a brilliant statement, Chad. Thank you. It's so simple, yet we forget. Yet we put it to the side and we, we choose to do other things. Well, I've I got to get my presents wrapped. I've got to get to work. I've got to do this. My kids are calling me. 
If we would only take time to express our gratitude towards him, if we would only put our best effort forward, can I tell you, he promised us that we would be rewarded for seeking him. Think about the gifts these wise men had to bring. It's pretty impressive when we don't totally understand the context of this, but if you just think of gold, that's a treasure deserving a king. Frankincense was a fragrant scent offered up to God during sacrificial worship. So it would be offered by the priest to God. And finally, myrrh was used as an oil to prepare a body for burial. Yet, listen to this. It was symbolizing, uh, it was a gift symbolizing the preservation of life after death. What an incredible gift to the one who would die for us all. Each one of these gifts were appropriate and highly significant. But can I tell you the best part? I mean, I think those gifts are great. I bet they were valuable, and I bet they cost them something. But what speaks to me this morning more than anything is the fact that they were willing to deliver them themselves. They could have sent messengers. They could have sent servants and said, take these to the king. But no, they picked up everything they had and they took off for months and traveled in order to deliver the gift themselves. See, we picture these three lone men. Like I said, this was a caravan. They traveled 600 miles through hostile desert. The Bible says it created a big stir in town. Three men rolling in on camels wouldn't have created a big stir. But as a caravan came into town, people began to notice. What do we bring to offer Christ that costs us? We have something to learn from this story. Brings me to point number four. Just because you get there doesn't mean you've arrived. Just because they made it to Christ and were able to offer the gifts didn't mean the relationship was over. We did our part. We're done. We're out. They very easily could have actually just taken that opportunity to go back to town and gloat and say, ha ha, we got to see Jesus. We told you. Instead, they did exactly what God told them to do. The wise men obeyed God's direction by not returning to Herod. The journey to Christ and their reward of faith had taught them to remain open to God's leading. And there is never a point in our lives when we can say we've arrived. When we can say, you know what, I've got Jesus in my heart, I'm good to go. Church, every single day, he deserves our best. And every single day, he has new mercies for us. He promised us that. Do you long for more of God in your own life? What are you willing to do? to receive more of God in your own life. Scripture concludes by telling us about these wise men. Matthew chapter 2, verse 12. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. They didn't show up and just say, it's our duty, it's over, we're out. Their seeking God didn't end with meeting Christ. They continued to remain open to him. And God gave them a message in a dream. Isn't that interesting? A dream. For men whose job was to interpret dreams, God spoke to them in a dream. First a star, now a dream. God is speaking to them in ways they can understand. Can I tell you? God will speak to you. If you're seeking him, if you're longing for more of him, he will speak to you in ways that you and understand. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, man, I read the Bible and I get nothing from it. I just read it and it's just words on a page and then I step away and I didn't get anything. If you will continue to seek God, continue to read his word, pray and ask him to help you, I promise you, he does not give up on you. He wants a relationship with you. Will become alive and real like you've never known before if you will seek him with all your heart that's the promise he gave us are you still seeking god today just because you sought christ at one time and found him doesn't mean that's the end of the journey that's actually the beginning so what place are you at today 
Let me ask that question. What place in this story are you at? Will you bow your heads with me? And I want, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Are you the one far from God that is hearing the calling to come and seek? Please remember that God continues to seek you, no matter where you came from, no matter what your background is. He loves you, and he wants that relationship with you. Don't give up on the journey, because he will not give up on you. Are you a worshiper of Christ? And if so, do you bring your best? Did you bring your best when you walked in this morning? And the songs began, and you're thinking, here we go. I don't know this song. I'm having to learn it. What's this about? What's this sermon about? This dude standing up there singing and preaching. What's that all about? The question is, did you come in planning to give your best to Christ? Lastly, are you open to God's continual leading in your life? Have you kind of had the attitude of, you know what, I'm saved, I've arrived, I'm good, I can just kind of float through life? If you will continue to follow him, if you will continue to be led by Christ, if you will seek him, he says we will be rewarded. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus is talking to the disciples. And he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Are you willing to deny yourself of anything, even a little bit of time? Are you willing to deny yourself a little bit of football this afternoon, or a little bit of family time, or whatever it may be for you, in order to have a little time with your creator? The one who deserves our best. I believe we can learn from these magi today who traveled hundreds of miles, journeyed <coughs> to seek out Christ. Father, we're here this morning. This morning. And God, we're going to seek after you in this moment. I pray that you would speak to us pray that we would not get caught up in the things around us and forget what you did for us and forget to bring our best. It's what you deserve. It's what you gave us. When you sent your son to this earth, you sent your best. You deserve nothing less than the same. Help us to remember that. May we make every effort to seek you and when we do, to bring our best. The Father, May we continue to do that every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.